Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session that we have planned for this afternoon that was supposed to be in the Greenwald Pavilion, but it's windy over there. And apparently they didn't want to carry away the tent and all of you with it. So thank you for joining us for this session in the Pepke Auditorium. I imagine that some people were going to continue to join us when they realize that it's not there. So as we have a little bit of foot traffic in, we'll all be um, you know, ready to welcome more people. And if you can help them find seats, that would be just great. My name is Arthur Brooks. Um, I teach happiness at Harvard University. When I tell people that, they think I'm lying. Because I teach at the Harvard Business School. The Harvard Business School. I mean, what? Finance, accounting, uh, you know, marketing, supply chain management, something really practical like that? No, 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 no. I say I teach happiness. And the reason for that is that I believe that the science of happiness, not just self-improvement, the science of happiness is a skill that you can learn. And furthermore, it is my belief that the central component of effective leadership is to be a happiness teacher. And that's what I want to talk about for the next hour, a little bit less than an hour, so you can get to your next meeting today. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you about a brand new project that I'm embarking on right now. It's based on a book that's coming out on September 12th, and my co-author, my, my partner in this, uh, this endeavor is, is Oprah Winfrey. We were talking over the past year about what do people most need? And she asked me this question. I mean, we're, I'm lucky enough to have her as, as kind of a sounding board on ideas I have for a little while. And, and she said, what do m most young people come to you complaining about in your office hours? You know, and they, what, what happens is that m my students, they come in to see me and, and they'll say, I want to, professor, I want to talk to you about my term paper. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to me about their term paper. Why are you really here? And we close the door. I'm the happiness professor after all. And they say basically something like this. Now these are second semester MBA students, second year at Harvard. I mean, these are people that are going out and you know what they want to be? They want to, well, they want to be a lot of you is who they want to be. <laughs> they want to be successful. They want to be admired. They want to make a bunch of money. Good for them. But they started to realize something in the second semester of their second year at the Harvard Business School. And, and here's what it kind of looks like. Here are the questions that I tend to get. Look, I can manage a business. I have an MBA. I can manage money. It's what I'm going to do for a living. Professor, how do I manage myself? Why? Because they feel out of control. They feel like, well, everything is kind of left up to chance emotionally for them. 55% of my students, give or take, are in therapy. Why? Because they feel that life has got them on the ropes, that they're being blown to and fro. And that's the big reason they take my class. Now, my class in the Science of Happiness, it's an elective, but I have two sections of 90, 400 on the waiting list. That's oversubscribed, obviously. I also have just recently learned that there's an illegal Zoom link they think I don't know about. <laughs> By the third week, their parents are watching the class because everybody wants the answer to these, these questions. What, what do we say under these circumstances? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about with you over the next 45 minutes. And here's the basic gist of what I tell my students, and, and quite frankly, what I tell myself. We, we want our students to run companies. We want our students to do startups. We want our students to do these beautiful things in the economy. But you know what the real startup is? There is something like 400 startups in this room. Each of you is the entrepreneur of your life. The truth is that the enterprise is you. And the currency of that enterprise must be managed. The currency of that enterprise is happiness and love, and faith and goodness and charity, and all of the things that we really want to live the best life. It's, it's not money. So how do you manage those currencies in the serious business of the enterprise of your life. That's the business that we have at hand today, that I'm dedicating my life to sharing with other people. Now, I'm a behavioral social scientist, so I study neuroscience, social psychology, behavioral economics, with a little bit of applied philosophy thrown in for good measure. This is not just feel-good stuff. This is deadly serious real science. But I'm trying to bring it to bear in the lives of 
of lay people. I write about this every week. I have a column on Thursday morning in the Atlantic about the science of happiness. Why? Because I believe that those of us that are blessed to have this academic knowledge, we must use it for real tangible ends in the lives of ordinary people. So, so hold me to the standard. If I do a good job, I want you to learn some things about what's going on inside you, inside your heart and your head, and I want you to share this with other people. And here's my, here's my promise to you. When this book comes out in September, if you still remember this presentation, send me an email and I'll send you these slides. But if I do this, you gotta do something for me too. I can't do it till September because Oprah will kill me. <laughs> but if you do that, here's the deal. You gotta take my name off and put your name on and give the lecture. So let's see if I do a good job making you ready for your first teaching experience in the science of happiness. I do two things in my classes. I teach my students about emotional basics for leaders. Why? Because if you want to be better, you need to understand you. This should not, you yourself should not be a mystery to you, and that it is, and you're gonna see why in a minute. And then after we talk about the basic science of your emotions, the neuroscience and social psychology of what's going on between your ears, then, then we talk about the, the best rules, the best methods for emotional self-management that are currently available, and that's what I wanna roll through. Now, obviously, I'm not gonna take six hours and walk you through a multi-phase module class, but in the next 45 minutes, I hope that you find some things that are elucidating, that are helpful, and that you can actually start to share. So, what are the emotional basics? How do your emotions work? My students, it's funny, because on the first day of class, I'll say, so you gave up all your elective points to take my class, thank you very much. You must know what happiness is. And then I cold call them, right? Cold calling is when you pick somebody out of the audience. I'm not gonna do that, because you didn't come here to, for, you know, for unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they always say the same thing. Oh, professor, happiness is the feeling I get when I'm with the people that I love. It's how I feel when I'm doing the things that I enjoy. And I say, wrong, happiness is not feelings. Happiness has feelings associated with it, but feelings are evidence of happiness, just like the smell of the turkey is evidence of your Thanksgiving dinner. The Thanksgiving dinner is actually something really tangible. That notwithstanding, feelings are critically important because they can spoil. If the, the, the smell is wrong, Thanksgiving dinner is not very appetizing. And if your feelings are getting in your way, you're not gonna have a very happy time of it. So how do we understand the way that emotions work? My students, and all of us practically, have emotions all wrong in general. We think of emotions as nice things and bad things, and we want to get rid of our negative emotions, and we want to have more positive emotions. That's how we think of it. That's exactly the wrong way to think about emotions. Emotions are a signal about what's going on in the outside world to help keep us alive, pass on our genes, and survive to, to eat and breed another day. Sorry to be clinical about it, but that's what Mother Nature wants. See, Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy. I wish she did. Mother Nature has two goals for you, which is survival and gene propagation. If you're gonna be happy, that's your business, not Mother Nature's business. So how do we understand feelings beyond nice things to have? There are ways that, um, that evolution has kept you alive generation after generation after generation. We often speak of the triune brain, where the brain's functions are separated into three distinct parts. There's the, the reptilian brain, the, most, the, the earliest evolved part of the human brain that we share with other lower organisms, that, that, that basically perceives the world outside you. It helps it so I can breathe without thinking and walk around without falling off the stage. I've done that before, I'm hoping not to do that today. Um, but it also makes it possible for me to see you and perceive the light and everything else around. That sends signals to what's called the limbic system of the brain at the very center of the human brain that has one job to take stimuli from the outside world and turn it into emotions. It's a machine language. Uh, the brain takes it in the second function of the human brain and make emotions to signal to you what's going on outside. I don't care what, your langu what language you speak, where you grew up, what your political opinions are, we all have the same emotions. It's amazing. And that's because we have to perceive the same signals and figure out how to react according to those signals. The third part of the human brain, is the neomammalian brain. It's the most human part of the brain. 
That's in the cortex, the, the wrinkly outside of the brain. The reason it's wrinkly, by the way, is it's a one meter square sheet of brain tissue that has to be scrunched up inside the cranium. That's why it's so wrinkly. And the front part of that is called the prefrontal cortex. That's the executive center of your brain. What do you do with that? That takes the signals, the feelings, from your limbic system, and it, then it makes you, it gives you the opportunity to figure out how to react to it. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this here in a minute. Now, most people think that emotions are nice to have or bad to have. And they want fewer bad emotions and more good emotions, as I mentioned a minute ago. Here's the reason you shouldn't want fewer negative emotions. Emotion researchers tell us that there are basically, depending on how you count them, six basic emotions. There are lots of emotions out there, but they're mostly cocktails, you know, complicated combinations of, of these six building blocks. They are in order, joy, interest, fear, sadness, anger, and disgust. There's four bad ones and two good ones. Why do we need more negative emotions than positive emotions? Because negative emotions keep you alive. Because they alert you to threat. Positive emotions, nice to have. Negative emotions, hmm. Let me tell you a little bit about how, how, how nature has evolved these emotions and we continue to have them no matter who we are and where we are in the world. Joy is an evolved emotion that's almost always a reaction to love. You get joy from your relationships. Why? Because evolution is rewarding you and wants to give you incentives to keep having lots of relationships. To be around people who will help you and protect you and help you have children and, and make sure you don't starve. It's kind of clinical. The second is interest. Interest in things is a basic positive emotion. If you're interested in what I'm talking about right now, that's giving you pleasure. Why do you need interest to give you pleasure? Because people survive when they learn. We're learning creatures. We're always making progress. You're in the Pleistocene, walking out of your cave and you find berries on a brand new bush. And it gives you joy, that learning experience. Now, you're not going to sit there looking at it for a certain, super long time because bad things could happen to you. Then you want to learn about more ways that you can eat delicious things. That's the reason in the evolved way that, that people are interested in TED Talks or the Aspen Ideas Festival or reading Dostoevsky or all the other good stuff out there because interest is inherently pleasurable. That's an evolved trait. Now the negative stuff. People don't want the negative things. Boy, you should be thankful for negative emotions. Let's start with fear. Why do you need fear? <laughs> so you can run away when something's scary. If you can't run away when something's scary, when you're not afraid of frightening things, you're gonna die. You would not have lived. Your Pleistocene ancestors would have been eaten summarily. They'd say, huh, it's a tiger. How interesting. Wrong emotion. <clears throat> Second, sadness. Why is sadness evolved? Some of you have a lot of sadness in your life. Look, we all have sadness. You don't have to go looking for it, it'll find you. Why is that an evolved trait that keeps you alive? You need to be aversive to loss, especially the loss of loved ones. Grief is a very interesting and complex emotion. We all feel grief at the, the loss of a loved one. What's actually happening? There's a part of the, the, the brain, the, the, the limbic system called the, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, that when somebody that you love is separated from you, that, that makes it light up and makes you feel physical pain. Grief makes you look for your loved ones because separation from your loved ones has to be painful in the in, in, in the ancient times. If you were not aversive to losing contact with your kin, You'd be walking the frozen tundra by yourself, which is a very dangerous state of affairs. You have to be sad so that you will try to avoid that. But today, of course, mm, grief, it happens in different ways. and It's so deeply uncomfortable. You lose somebody that you love. We all have. We all will. And your, your brain is trying to put you back into contact, but you can't because the person that you love has passed on or has disappeared or has vanished from your life. And so it's like the black box in the bottom of an ocean of a, a crashed jetliner, and it pings, and it pings, and it wants to come home, and it pings, and then the battery dies, and it stops pinging. Grief is a funny thing, isn't it? But you need it. And you know what is the weirdest thing of all about grief? That people grieve for the loss of their grief, because that's the last contact that they have, they feel, with the person that they loved. Nature's funny. 
anger. Of course, this is how you fight or have flight or freeze or any of the other reactions when there's threat. And last but not least, there's disgust. Disgust has a part of the brain that governs it called the insula. The insula has one job, which is when you go to the refrigerator and you find something you forgot about three months ago. And you, it, you do this, and you're like, mm. The insula in your brain is saying, don't eat it, you might die. It alerts you to pathogens. Now, it's an interesting phenomenon that we see that you can also have disgust toward fellow human beings. And you know, one of the things that dictators all have in common, they're trying to fire up the insula of your brain in response to other of your sisters and brothers in the human race. That's the reason they'll talk about people and compare them to rats and cockroaches, the unwashed, the impure. And by the way, no matter what your political views are, there are leaders in this country on your side that are trying to stimulate your insula into feeling disgust toward other people. All genocides are based on this basic human emotion deployed toward other people. Now that you know it, you're going to recognize it. Don't fall prey to it. Okay, now, all of this is to say, some good, lots of bad, all important. That's what it comes down to. How does it work inside the human brain? Let me give you an example of how our ancient brains are adapted to the current environment. You're walking across the street, not in Aspen, because people are pretty civilized here, but in a city that has, let's say, traffic that's unpredictable. And you're in a crosswalk, you're a pedestrian, and somebody runs a light, the, the, the car speeding toward you at 40 miles an hour, it crosses the visual cortex in the occipital lobe of the brain. That registers in your visual cortex as an oncoming predator, a large predator if that's after you. That's what your brain is telling you. That's a big animal that's going to eat me, or the equivalent thereof. That, as it crosses the visual cortex, will then alert the amygdala in the limbic system of the brain to send a signal to the, through the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, which then stimulates the adrenal glands above your kidneys, and that spits out stress hormones. Cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, that happens in 74 milliseconds. That's good stuff. Because by the time you even know what's going on, you've jumped out of the way, your heart is pumping, you're sweating, and you've already flipped off the driver. <laughs> Three seconds later, when your prefrontal cortex catches up with all of this, you say, oh, I shouldn't have flipped off the driver. Those aren't my values. What, what has saved your life? The limbic system of your brain has saved your life. And that's an amazing thing. So that's how all of this works. You should be thankful for your negative emotions. That's what I tell my students all the time. They don't want it at first, but when they start to realize how important this is, then they can actually move to the, 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 they can move to the truth that bad emotions should not be eradicated. They should be managed, and that's where we're going. Now, based on this, I've talked to you about the positive and negative emotions and the basic science of positive and negative emotions. Now, let me tell you how they, how they coexist inside you. See, the truth of the matter is that we all have both. And for the longest time, researchers believed that happy, happiness and unhappiness, positive and negative, they were simply mirror images of the other. That unhappiness was effectively the, the absence of happiness. That's completely wrong. Based on the work of neuroscientists at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, especially Richard Davidson, one of the most distinguished neuroscientists who's working today, we find actually that positive and negative emotions are largely processed in opposite hemispheres of the brain. Specifically, negative emotions light up the right side of your brain. Positive emotions, the left side of your brain. We know this from fMRI studies. And it's an interesting fact. You can think about this yourself. When you're aggravated and you kind of scrunch up your face in a grimace, it's always asymmetric. And it turns out the side of your face that's really easy to scrunch up is the left side of your face, because the right side of your brain controls the left side of your face. Richie Davidson demonstrated this in his fabulous fMRI studies by showing that when people are induced to have negative emotions, aversive emotions, they get involuntary muscular movement in the left side of their face. Here's a way that you can actually experience this yourself. Most of you have kids. Some of you have little kids. Some of you, like me, I have a little grandson at this point. And it's a funny thing about kids, that when something bad happens, they fall down, you get a few seconds before you know what's going to happen next. <laughs> like, they fall down, and you're looking at them, and they look at you, and you're like, it's going to go either way. It's going to laugh, or you're going to cry. 
Which one is it gonna be? And it could be either one. Now, by the way, we're like this too. We just like to pretend this is a kid thing. But the kid falls down, and then you look at the kid. You know how you, you, know how you can tell what's gonna happen next? Look for a little twitch on the left side of their face. They'll twitch a little bit. And that means the right side of their brain is inordinately active and the waterworks are coming. Okay, now what is this pointing out to us? Happiness and unhappiness with respect to positive and negative emotional states can be separated. This is super important because what that means is you need both, you can distinguish both, and you can manage both. But you gotta know what each is in your particular circumstances, your life. Now, here's the interesting thing that's followed on this research. For the longest time, researchers thought, well, if you're happy, it means you're not unhappy. So more happy means less unhappy, more unhappy means less happy. You know already that that's completely wrong because you've got these positive and negative emotions that are lighting up your brain in all sorts of interesting and complex ways and even on different sides of the, the geography of your brain, we can, we can discern these things. So what researchers have done is to ask how much of your time is spent in positive and negative states. Now, your results may vary and I'm gonna talk about that here in a second, but the average person is walking around with this mix of emotions. In 90% of the cases, or at 90% of the time, you can discern what your emotions are, positive or negative. Now, you might say to yourself, what is a mixed emotional state? Lots of mixed emotional states out there. You know those days where, I mean, you're in Aspen, it's warm, and the sun is shining, and everything is good, and you're gonna to go to a lecture on happiness, it's just great, but there's something wrong. And that something wrong is in your personal life. And it's like a phantasm that's kind of following you around a little bit. And so you're having a happy day, but it keeps kind of intruding. You know that intrusion where you kind of like, oh, something's bothering me. Oh yeah, that. I got that bad phone call, right? I can be having a really, really good day at the university and I get an email from the dean and it's like, we need to talk. That's a bad email, but I don't know how bad. So the result is I'm still having a happy day, but I'm thinking, oh, the email. Oh, the email. That's a mixed state, as it turns out. In about 41% of the time, people are walking around in pretty much exclusively positive states. That's usually kind of your idol. Think about that as your car. Positive states. Not intense. This is not, you know, over the moon, joyful, clicking your heels together. This is just kind of, life's pretty good. That's what most people are most of the time. Negative states are way more intense than positive states. Almost always negative states are more intense. So you recognize them a lot more. And those exclusively negative states are about 16% of the time. By the way, that's a lot. We're talking about more than an hour of your waking time is spent in a, in a purely negative state per day. Mixed states are these kind of the, the positive idol plus the negative intrusion inside your life, and that's 33% of the time. So think about it. You're, the average person is feeling negative things 49% of your waking hours. If you're wondering why you feel bad things so much, because you're normal. That's just life. Now you can think, since I'm having lots of discomfort, lots of unhappiness, lots of pain, lots of suffering, lots of difficulty, it's evidence that I'm defective. But that's an error. That's evidence that you're on earth. That's evidence that you're alive. If you didn't have those things, your ancestors would have died off, and you're not having an authentic human experience. The number one mistake that my students make today is that they're living the opposite of the hippie mantra, if it feels good, do it. I remember when my dad heard that for the first time. I grew up in Seattle, in a, a, you know, like a lower middle class neighborhood in Seattle. And, I, and Woodstock happened when I was five years old, so my parents didn't let me go, because they're squares. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but I remember there was this hippie on TV, you know, I was watching TV with my dad. And, and, and you know, I was asked about what's the philosophy of this whole thing. He says, if it feels good, do it. And my dad said, that's the end of America. <laughs> he was kind of right. Anyway, so <clears throat> the mantra today among my students is if it feels bad, make it stop. If it hurts, make it go away. If, it, if I'm suffering, treat it. <laughs> I've got to treat it because it's evidence of, def of defective nature. No, 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 it's not. Absolutely. If you make all of your negative emotions go away, woe be unto you. You won't survive to live another day. What you need to do is to understand it, to embrace it, to be thankful for it, and to manage it. And the first part of that is deeply understanding it.
Let's think a little bit about, this might not describe you, your unique mix. One of my favorite surveys that I give all of my students, and all of you can take it as well, is called the Positive Affect Negative Affect Series. This is a survey that will net out your negative and positive emotions to look at your unique affect balance. How much of the time are you feeling intense positive things versus intense negative things? And everybody's different. It turns out there are four kinds of people. You know you can separate out these things, and when you measure these things, there are four kinds of people in terms of your affect balance. There are people who have high positive affect and high negative affect. You have lots and lots of strong emotions is what it comes down to. These are mad scientists, right? A quarter of you are mad scientists. There are some of you who are feeling intense positive emotion a lot, but kind of weak negative emotion. You're cheerleaders. Everybody wants to be a cheerleader. I hate you. Okay, but, and everybody wants to be that because it's so pleasant. By the way, you don't want a CEO who's a cheerleader because cheerleaders can't accept, good, can't accept bad news, they won't take bad information, and they can't give anybody a bad review. Classic cheerleader CEO behavior. They come into your office and they're like, you're doing a great job. And you're like, wow, it's great. It's like, thank you for all you're doing for this company. I love it. Well, thank you. That's really wonderful. And then there's that, that incompetent idiot in the office next door, and you hear your boss go to the next office and say the same thing to him or her. That's a cheerleader, right? So everybody wants to be that, but, but don't fool yourself. It's not that great for the rest of us. That's high positive, low negative. Now, there are also some of you, a quarter of the population to be exact, that are high negative, low positive. These are the poets. These are the poets. Now, there's, that's not an incidental analogy that I'm making between this profile, this affect profile, and poets. We find that people who are especially artistic tend to have this affect profile. <laughs> and, and how do we know this, by the way? One of the things that especially high negative affect people have in common is they have a part of the brain called the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex that's hyperactive. If you want to know what that does, it makes you ruminate. So people who are clinically depressed, they ruminate a lot. Ruminate, 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 ruminate. But you know what artists do? They ruminate a lot on creative projects. You know what entrepreneurs do? They ruminate on a business plan. That's the reason that depression and creativity are linked through this component of the human brain, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and that's the reason that the most creative people are typically the poets who also suffer a lot. Now, before you regret being a poet, we need poets. Now, that means that we really, really need you, and what we need to learn to do is to love you and help you more. More on that in a second. And last but not least, there's low, low. Low affect people. You know low affect people? You've met them? Kind of cool, under pressure all the time? Those are the judges. Low, low. Unperturbable. It doesn't mean they're not unhappy or happy. It means that their experience and expression of those moods, of those feelings, of those affect states, tends to be quite low compared to the rest of us. Now here's a, a chart that looks across the, the population of my students at Harvard, my Harvard Business School students. In the general population, here are the four quadrants, the mad scientists, the cheerleaders, the judges, and the poets, and the, across the population, it's quarters, because these are the average scores across the population, so they have to go into equal quarters across the population. What do you see about my students? Who are my students? Mad scientists. And by the way, AB, that stands for Arthur Brooks. That's me. I'm the maddest of the mad scientists. Right? I'm hard to live with. I'm married to a mad scientist, too. It's brutal. <laughs> right? My wife is from Spain, where, you know, it's like, and at first, you know, because we, we, we fight all the time. We've been married for 32 years. It's just like daggers drawn for 32 years. It's exhausting. And at first, I'm like, well, it's of course because fighting is a form of communication in Spain. But, you know, it's just kind of the national sport, as a matter of fact, right? But then I realized, as I became a social scientist, that this was because we had, we had conflicting, similar affect profiles. And the result of knowing that has been miraculous for the quality of my marriage. <laughs> because I see me in her, and she sees her in me. And in doing that, we can appreciate each other more and come back from the brink more often without ruining 48 hours of our marriage um, unnecessarily. What you find is that knowing this about yourself is really critical because you can complement your affect profile with people who truly complement you. How did I use this when I was a CEO? I used to be the president of a think tank in Washington, D.C. I did that for 11 years. And when I learned about this, when I started studying this material as a social scientist, God bless you, I started hiring people to my executive team that were not me. 
What does that mean? I needed more low affect people. I started, as a mad scientist, I started hiring for judges. I wanted calm people. Now I have this company, this company about teaching happiness, about writing and speaking and teaching happiness, because it's my thing. It's in Washington, DC, I have a CEO, the coolest of the coolest. And the crazier I get, the better she gets. Because she knows, she's taken the test. We know that she's actually a, a compliment to me. My co-author, Oprah Winfrey, she's a judge. We work together spectacularly well. She finds me hugely entertaining, <laughs> right? And I find her enormously calming. And that's how we were able to write a book together. If you're a mad scientist like me, find your judge. If you're a cheerleader, find your poet. Find people who complete you and love them and appreciate them and stop regretting yourself, for Pete's sake, because this is natural. What you need to do is not to treat your emotions away, it's to understand them and to manage them to better effect. And that's what I want to talk about now. Because really the heart of the matter is based on emotional basics, this. Your feelings exist to keep you alive. Thank God for your negative feelings. Your positive and negative feelings are separable and exist at the same time, and you have a unique and beautiful positive and negative affect profile. It's good. Furthermore, the goal is not to fix your negative emotions. It's your, the management of your negative emotions so that you can do the most good in your life and the most good in the lives of other people. So how do you do that? That's the trick, isn't it? Here are the three big methods for managing your emotions. They are metacognition, emotional caffeine, and an experience of the I self. One is based on psychology, one on neuroscience, and one is based on philosophy. And I'm gonna tell you about all three. First is metacognition. This is, this is Saint Boethius, a Catholic saint from the sixth century. Now he's well known more as a philosopher than he is in the Catholic Church. And the reason is because of famous works that he wrote in prison. He was a, a counsel, an advisor to a Theodoric the Great, the Ostro Ostrogothic king um, at the time and a pretty arbitrary and capricious king he was because he got wind of a, 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 a treasonous plot to have him killed, and he blamed it on Boethius, who was completely innocent, thrown in prison. Boethius, while in prison, no, he was facing certain death for something he did not commit, and he was bitter about it, as any of us would be. Well, one night, while he was lying on his bed, he had a vision that he was, that he was visited by Lady Philosophy. Lady Philosophy came into his cell, and inspired him to understand one of the great truths of life, which is that you can't control your feelings, but you can control your reactions to the feelings. See, here's the deal. You can't control your limbic system, but at least not if you're not using heavy pharmaceuticals, but you can control the executive center of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, which is the way that you send the signal, not from the limbic system to govern you, but from your prefrontal cortex to govern it. Your reactions are your interior CEO. That's what Boethius was talking about in this particular case. Here's the limbic system of the brain. Reactive people, they're always being managed by their emotions, right? You know when you, you got a little kid and you're trying to get the little kid to stop screaming all the time? And so, and so you say, use your words. Remember when your kids were little? Use your words. What are you telling them to do? You're telling them to use their prefrontal cortex instead of just their limbic system. And those people that always get really angry and have to blurt out some sort of an insult when they're, when they're mad at you, and then they're always apologizing, it's because they're highly limbic. Many of our current populist politicians are limbic people, very limbic. I would like a little more prefrontal cortex in, in, in American politics today. Why? Because if you can do the trick of experiencing your emotions in the prefrontal cortex of your brain, you will still have intense emotions, but you can decide the reaction to those emotions. And every philosophical and religious and meditation technique known to humankind is all about doing that. That is called metacognition, awareness of your thinking process. So a lot of work that I've done over the years is how does meditation actually help you emotionally? The answer is it gives you an opportunity to meditate on your emotions. I'm a meditator. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Catholic meditator. So my Catholic faith is the most important thing in my life. And, and, and I, I pray the rosary every night before I go to sleep, which is a meditative prayer. And one of the things I notice when I'm praying the rosary every night is I say, Arthur is sad today. 
And in the statement of that acknowledgement of my emotional state, I have moved the experience of those emotions into the prefrontal cortex of my brain. Another way that I do that is I walk a lot. I've walked the Camino de Santiago across northern Spain, hundreds of kilometers, twice I've done it. And when I'm walking, 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 walking in nature, I'm learning about my emotions, I'm learning about myself. And in so doing, I'm moving my emotional experience into the prefrontal cortex of my brain. You can do it by studying the works of Johann Sebastian Bach or the Stoic philosophers or traditional philosophies or, or the religion of your youth or therapy. Because what good therapy is all about is not trying to fix your emotions. It's helping you understand and manage your emotions. If any of you are in therapy and you say, I just want to feel better, and your therapist said, I'm going to help you feel better, get a new therapist. <laughs> you need a therapist who says, I'm going to give you a PhD in you. And in so doing, your executive center can govern what you're doing. That's what it's supposed to be all about, is the learning experience, the metacognitive experience. Now, how do I want to cement this idea for you? I was thinking about what's influenced me to, in, 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 in our culture to make this point. This is not just neuroscience and social psychology. All around us, we can look at how people have talked about this in different ways. I want to play for you a, a poem that I love by Sir Rudyard Kipling. You've heard it before. This is read by Sir Michael Caine. This is an exposition of metacognition. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor look too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life for broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at the beginning and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are done and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 40 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Sir Michael Caine does it better than I do. <laughs> That's metacognition. Here's the point. Live cortically, not limbically. The choice is yours. Move your emotions into your executive brain. Understand your feelings, but choose your reactions. This is method number one. Method number two is emotional caffeine. Now, most of you had coffee this morning. So did I. I'm crazy for it. I grew up on the north side of Queen Anne Hill in Seattle, and, and there was one Starbucks when I was in eighth grade, and I was a client. I was a regular customer. I've been drinking a venti dark roast since I was a lad. My grizzled hypothalamus, oh my goodness, it's uh, my, my enervated uh, uh, adrenal glands, they bear the witness, they bear the scars of all the Starbucks that I've consumed over the years. Why do I love it? You know on the side it says that first sip feeling? Here's what the first sip feeling is. You have inhibitory and excitatory neuromodulators in your brain, some that wake you up, 
and some that calm you down. There's an inhibitory neuromodulator in your brain called adenosine. It builds up over the course of the day to make you sleepy, so you can go to sleep at night. When you wake up in the morning, there's a lot of it floating around in your brain, and that's why you're groggy in the morning. You want to get rid of that, so how do you do it? You go drink a big cup of Starbucks or whatever your monster energy drink thing groove is. 95% of Americans consume caffeine literally every day. It's the most popular drug in the world. Why? Because the caffeine molecule looks just like the adenosine molecule. It plugs into the receptors for adenosine and the adenosine can't get in there. Caffeine doesn't pep you up. It makes it impossible for you to calm down. That's what caffeine does for you. That's the first sip feeling, which is a lot less poetic than what's written on the cup. However, this is an important way for us to understand another method for us to regulate and manage our emotional selves. One of the things that you find in classic philosophy, and this is modern philosophy in the, in the form of psychology, this is William James, the great philosopher, psychologist. Um, I, as we say at Harvard, this is my colleague, William James. Um, <clears throat> We like to say stuff like, anyway, so William James talked about a very interesting principle that we call in my business the as if principle. The as if principle is basically this. If you have an intrusive emotion, don't wipe it out or blunt it or numb it. Find a, an alternative emotion and choose it instead. Choose caffeine instead of adenosine. This is a well-studied principle that he proposed and subsequent research in neuroscience and social psychology has borne out the idea again and again and again. For example, we find that when people are experiencing sadness, if they have an adroitness for humor, they will, some of the saddest people, especially those prone to clinical depression, will often be the funniest people you've ever met. My friend Rain Wilson is here. He's known as Dwight from the office for those of you who've been living in a cave for the past couple of decades. <laughs> Rain and I have been palling around for a little while together. He grew up five miles away from me in Seattle, as a matter of fact, in the same time. We didn't know each other back then. He played the bassoon and I played the French horn. And we've become friends as adults. He has a, a documentary they put together about the preponderance of clinical depression among, among comedians. Why are so many comedians clinically depressed? You could say, well, because they're funny, it makes them depressed. Wrong. Their sadness makes them into comedians. Why? Because they're spontaneously using emotional caffeine. One of the great defense mechanisms is saying, instead of the sadness, I'm going to make a joke. Now, you can't substitute happiness for sadness because you're not stupid. You're feeling the sadness. You can't just put joy into there because that's not a, an adequate fit. That's a bad fit. It's not a caffeine molecule at all. You need something that's good, but just off opposite. And, and humor fits the bill. People will often find that when they're resentful of something, that they can choose gratitude. Many of you have put together gratitude lists, and you find that gratitude is one of the best ways to, for you to feel better when you're feeling resentful about the world. You think, oh, it's because it reminds me to count my blessings. No! You're filling the, the resentment the, uh, receptors with your gratitude. It's a perfect technique. Pessimism. Don't choose optimism. You're not stupid. Your brain won't take it. Choose hope. Optimism is just a prediction. Everything's going to be okay. If you don't think everything's going to be okay, don't predict it's going to be okay. Instead, you need hope, which is the will to act in accordance to what can be better, whether it's good or not. I'm a, I'm a hopeful pessimist, personally, because I don't necessarily think certain things are going to turn out okay, but I think good things can be done, and I've got the agency to do it. And that's the reason that hope is the perfect substitute emotion for pessimism. You get the idea. And here's how it works. The as-if principle can truly transform your life. And here's an example of this that we get from our culture. Y'all know this painting. If you don't, you probably know the artist. This is Norman Rockwell from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The, jo the, the, the purveyor of joy in painting form. You want to feel happy? Look at Norman Rockwell's paintings. They're joyful experience after blissful family reunions. Again and again and again. This is a you know, young man coming home from probably World War II at Christmas time with his arms full of Christmas presents. Here's what you don't know about Norman Rockwell. He suffered his whole life with clinical depression. He, was, uh, he moved to Stockbridge, Massachusetts because of the, the hospital in Stockbridge, Massachusetts was the home of Eric Erickson, one of the most distinguished psychoanalysts of his time. He moved to Stockbridge to be near his therapist because he went to therapy literally every day. You want to know why he painted so many Saturday evening post covers? Because Eric Erickson was expensive. 
He was literally painting to pay his therapist. Eric Erickson was expensive and also rich, as it turns out. And here was what Eric Erickson told Norman Rockwell. Paint your longing. What do you want? What do you want? I want to be better. I want to, I want to face life with less pessimism. Paint it. <clears throat> Paint your longing. And that's what he did. The reason he did that, because that's not who he was. That's, you think, oh yeah, look at these paintings. Norman Rockwell is supposed to be a really, really happy guy. Here's Norman Rockwell. That's not a happy guy. <clears throat> right? You know how he painted himself? Here's Norman Rockwell's self-portrait. <laughs> so here's the guy, the depressed guy. Here's the, the guy he painted, which is the man he wanted to be. And he's got it surrounded by these images of greatness, images of happiness. Here's the point for you and me. You want things. So do I. Imagine the thing that you want and that actually is appropriate in the circumstances and act as if you felt that. Paint your longing. Choose the emotion that, that you want that fits. <laughs> act as if you feel. Fake it till you make it. It actually works. That's number two. Number three is an ancient Zen Buddhist koan of a, a monk, an, uh, an old monk walking down a road. And a junior monk is walking toward him. And he, he recognizes the older monk. And he said, he said, what are you doing? And the older monk says, I'm on a pilgrimage. And the junior monk says, where is your pilgrimage taking you? And the older monk says, I don't know. He says, how can you not know? Why don't you know? And he says, because not knowing is the most intimate. What does that mean? Well, pondering that is what Zen Buddhism asks, is that you know, the technique of Zen Buddhism is to ponder in hard questions like that. But clearly what this means <clears throat> is that if you want an intimate look at life, you need to walk without knowing. You need to be looking outward. You need to be in an attitude of pure observation. You want to know why you feel bad? Because you're looking in a mirror all the time. And it's no fun. This is one of the most solid and profound principles of social psychology today. The worst way for you to get happier is to pay attention to yourself. The best way to miss your life is to fail to look outward in an attitude of observation, to understand that the truth of life is a pilgrimage where you don't know the destination because that is the most intimate. What is life? What is the beautiful thing in life? It's called the I-self. Psychologists and philosophers will call it the I-self. The I-self is different than the me-self. There's really two you's out there. There's the I-self, which is that I am the subject, meaning I'm looking at all of you. The me-self is the fact that you're looking at me, and if I'm paying attention to the fact that you're looking at me, I become paralyzed. And life is a lot less good. I-self makes you happy. Me-self makes you self-conscious is the whole idea. So the trick, the third method, is to get more I-self and less me-self. If you're I-self just observing the world, the world is full of majesty and amazing things. You'll be filled with awe. The Eiffel Tower. You look at that, you're not thinking of you. You're thinking of the genius of human architecture. You want to know how to ruin this? Let me show you how to ruin this. You know how you turn that from the I-self into the me-self? Like that. (laughs) That's how you do it. Then you know what it is? It's me in front of the Eiffel Tower. You'll ruin that. By the way, I'm just asserting that, right? You want the data? You don't know how to ruin your vacation? Let me show you how how to ruin your vacation in three easy steps. Step one, take a selfie in front of something famous. What do we find? Studies of this find that if you're taking pictures during your vacation of yourself, and you're thinking especially about posting them on social media, you will literally not remember your vacation you will be substituting the pictures you're taking for others for the experience that you're having. Why? Because you're not really there. The great Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh talked about the miracle of mindfulness, and he opens his book by talking about washing the dishes. When you're washing the dishes, he says, you need to pay attention to washing the dishes, because if you don't pay attention to washing the dishes, you're not actually washing the dishes, and you're missing your life. She's missing her life right now, because she's living it for somebody else who doesn't even care about her. Or she's trying to make feel envious. That's the reason that literally you'll impair your memory and you'll miss your life by living in the me self. You'll have 18% less enjoyment 
when you share your experiences. I mean, it's like this is the, this is the, you know, the illusion of, 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 of complete metrics and total precision. 18%, not 19%, 18%. But this is the best way for you to spoil the best moments of your life and to not enjoy the experiences that people have around you. Live for the attitude of observation. Don't take the pictures. You know what? Get rid of the mirrors. I work with this guy who's a, he's my trainer. He's a personal fitness guy. He used to be a fitness model. <laughs> he used to be an Instagram fitness influencer, right? He did it for 10 years he was doing this. And, and he said he was just miserable. He said he was just sad and miserable and depressed all the time. And he knew he had to stop it. He didn't know what to do. So you know how he fixed it? He literally took every mirror out of his house. He got rid of every mirror in his house. And then for a year, he showered in the dark so he couldn't see his own body. Ah, that's taking matters into your own hands, man. Like, but, but, but ask yourself this, how much time are you looking in the mirror? How much time are you looking at your mentions? How much time are you thinking about what other people think about you? How much are you in the mirror? How much are you in the me self? Those are wasted moments of your life. Now, Mother Nature wants you to do it. She wants you to do it so you can fit into your group and so you can have high social status and so you can survive a little bit more and so you can pass on your genes because you look all sexy on Instagram. It's another way of talking about passing on your genes. Hmm? Don't do it. Not knowing is the most intimate. Become the I self. Get rid of the mirrors. Observe your life with less judgment. You know, the, the me self is, is all, you know, this coffee is cold, I don't like it. You know, it's a little bit too humid today in Aspen, Colorado. It's kind of windy, I might miss my flight and I don't like that because it's gonna make me late. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Stand, you know the best way to do this is to stand in awe. My, my friend Dacker Keltner, who teaches happiness at in University of California at Berkeley, which is a, you know, a lesser university. <clears throat> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, he talks about the, he has a, a big best-selling book this year called Awe, Awe, A-W-E. And he says the best way to be the I self is to look outward and just be amazed. Do more amazing things and be impressed by them. <laughs> you know, my favorite composer is Johann Sebastian Bach. And you know how I stand in awe? I was a classical musician for a long time. I spent my, I dropped out of college when I was 19, dropped out kicked out, splitting hairs. And uh, <clears throat> I went on the road until I was 30, and I played in the Barcelona Symphony, and I was a professional classical musician, and my favorite composer was Johann Sebastian Bach. When I need more awe, when I need more eye self, you know what I do? I listen to this. So I stand in awe, and, 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 and by the way, how did Bach live these methods? <laughs> he wasn't perfect. He had the same moods that we do. He was asked before he died, Herr Bach, why do you write music? Has anybody ever asked you why you do what you do? You need an answer, not what do you do. Why do you do what you do? Here was his answer. The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the enjoyment of man. Often also, it's also, he often thought that he said, the refreshment of the soul. 
don't be distracted if you're not a traditionally religious person. He's saying basically this, the point of my music <laughs> is love. Why do I do what I do? Because I love you. <laughs> this is the big secret. And this is the really big takeaway because this is really the last method of all that ties everything together. You wanna to remember everything I've said here? Metacognition, emotional caffeine, the I self. Here's how it all comes together. When you feel hatred, when you have hatred in your life, choose to react with love. This, love is not a feeling, friends. It's not a feeling any more than happiness is a feeling. <laughs> love is to will the good of the other as other. Those are the words of St. Thomas Aquinas in 1265. To love is an act, it's a commitment, it's a choice. Love is a choice that comes from your prefrontal cortex. It's the ultimate act of rebellion against a world full of hate. Second, there's emotional caffeine. You feel fear? You feel fear, your amygdala is a little bit fired up? How do you react? By illuminating the other side of your brain which produces the cognitions of love. You literally cannot feel fear when you experience love. Choose love when you feel fear. And last but not least, you wanna be loved? I do. You know the best way to do it? Not by posting on social media. That's not the best way to get authentic love. No, 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 because envy is not the same thing as love. You wanna be loved? Look outward in love. Choose to love others, and that's what you will draw to yourself. The, what I'm telling you is basically that the secret to all of this is to experience and to act according to the dictates of the laws of love in your life, to react with love, to choose love, and to, to exhibit love when that's the thing that you most want, because happiness, my friends, is love. This is an idea that I hope you will remember. And my promise to you once again is when this is all official, this is literally the first time I've talked about this research. And thank you for being the first audience, by the way, for this and, and letting me do my premiere. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I flunked the test because I went five minutes over, so I'm going to let you go now. But if you want to keep in touch with me on this after September, I will gladly send you all these particular materials. But here's what I need from you. Pass these ideas on. We have a country, we have a world that needs more self-management and needs more love. And if we start a mission right here in Aspen, Colorado, which is a darn good place to start this particular mission, we can actually achieve these things in our lives and the lives of other people. God bless you. Thank you.